Okay, um, so welcome everyone to today's um, Political Studies Association Teaching and Learning Network webinar. Um, today we have Professor Helen Williams, uh, who is a Professor of Political Science Education and Associate um, Pro Vice Chancellor of Education and Student Experience, uh, coming to talk to us about her experiences um, in teaching uh, statistics to the social sciences using the software package um, SPSS. Um, if you can keep webcams and um, microphones off for now, the webinar will be recorded to go up on um, the YouTube channel at the end of it. And uh, at the end of the presentation, um, I'll stop the recording so that we can have a, a more sort of frank Q&A. OK, thank you very much, Helen, for, for joining us. Right, thanks for having me today. So I normally I'm speaking about teaching statistics using SPSS, but I have taught statistics using a range of other packages. So that comes into some of the points a little bit. Um, but just to say, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about where the background is of how I arrived at where I am and why I've taught with the specific software packages I have, because it does influence the way that I've approached teaching statistics. Um, a little bit to do a plug for my poor book that came out the week that the entire country shut down for COVID. So I was just gearing up to do publicity and then everyone went home and sat in a corner uh, and then we can have any questions. So just to kind of lay the foundation of where I'm coming from, um, when I was a PhD student, we were taught statistics in a kind of disciplinary agnostic way that was entirely focused on the statistics side of things. So this is what I would class here as a standalone approach where you're focused on the mastery of statistics, but it doesn't achieve high engagement from students. And often you don't really understand what you're doing. When I looked back at my statistics notes several years after the fact, I thought it couldn't actually have been as horrible as I remember it because what I remembered was doing cross tabs with chi-square tests involving um, cigarette consumption and car ownership. And I went back and I looked at my notes and we were indeed doing cross tabs of cigarette consumption and car ownership. And I still remember the one session when somebody bravely put up their hand and they said, but what is chi-square as in why in the world would we use this thing what is its application and the lecturer launched into a half hour maths demonstration of how to calculate chi-square at the end of which nobody had a clue what chi-square was but we had all learned the lesson not to ask questions about it so that was my background my introduction to statistics as a student but I've also encountered kind of embedded approaches where it's very much based on looking at the literature in the disciplinary context, um, but very little in the way of application of doing it yourself. So it's these are the kind of approaches of let's not skip past that table that's in the journal article. Let's talk about what it means. Let's learn how to critique it. But we don't actually learn how to produce it ourselves. And the approach that I've tended to take is very much a kind of third way where I'm aiming for high engagement from students where they're learning it in a disciplinary context. So even when we have arguments about efficiency of, oh, well, they're learning the same techniques, so why can't we pull seven different disciplines together into the same classroom? And I argue very much that you're dealing with so many different aspects of learning at the same time. You've got a computer, program that you've never used. You have mathematical concepts that you may not be familiar with. You don't even have the disciplinary hook to kind of interpret any of that information. Um, the downside of taking this medium approach is you get the medium mastery. So you get the disciplinary engagement, you get over the fear of the software, but you can't expect to get as far in terms of statistics. So how I arrived at this conclusion, I started by teaching as a graduate teaching assistant when I was doing my PhD. And I was given the very sage advice that if I always wanted to have teaching for financial reasons, I should sign up to teach statistics because I wasn't scared of numbers. And then I would always have teaching available because nobody else wanted to do it. 
And then I went from that to being a module team member when I got my first job as a full academic. And then, then I took over that module and I turned it into designing political research, which I taught using an applied focus and it combined qualitative and quantitative research. That was a core module for second years. Um, and then I moved down to first year and taught statistics using Excel. But the commonalities to all of these experiences was that I was teaching non-specialists. So this was not a quants pathway, not a QSTAT. There's often students who are there under duress though to speak, so they didn't have a choice about taking that module because it's compulsory. I could never assume that they had any inherent interest in numbers because often the students would say, well, I signed up to a politics degree, wasn't expecting to do any numbers. A lot of them were likely to exit this skill set after one module. So I had one chance. And we, I mean, we'd get somewhere between 25 and 50% of them who would voluntarily take more in the following year, but we couldn't bet on that. We could bet that there were quite a lot of students who would only take the one that was compulsory and then stop. And therefore, I really needed it to have a graphical user interface because they were already grappling with new software, new ideas, and new topics all at the same time. And if we're only going to do one shot at this ever, then I didn't want to do it in R because of the added um, input of just grappling with yet another piece of software that, I mean, there are skins, of course, that you can put onto R that makes it more of a graphics user interface, but it's not as developed. Um, so my approach to teaching stats is entirely focused on an applied focus. So I'm working with students who didn't think they'd ever have to touch numbers again. I have, I would say the majority of my students are struggling with basic mathematical concepts. So I say when we learn row and column percentages, for example, really important for basic descriptive statistics, but it's a very, very difficult concept for a lot of our students to learn. And that is despite most of them having achieved a C or better in most cases, much higher than that on GCSE maths. But the understanding of the concept, the story that this tells is very weak. I use examples that are drawn from their other modules. So it's a basic scaffolded learning approach of what else are we teaching in the curriculum? Therefore, what could they expect to encounter on their degree? And using those examples to teach statistics. Um, I've tried to incorporate both international relations and comparative politics. So it's not just focused on elections data sets, but actually looking at kind of human development and other aspects as well. I firmly don't believe in producing teaching data sets. So I know that this has in the past been a very common way of doing it, where somebody takes a data set and then they strip it down to the bare bones and you have say 12 variables and they've all been tidied up really nicely. I don't do that as well. Even when teaching first years, I want them to feel by the end of a module that they can go on uh, the UK data service, for example, download a data set and not be completely flabbergasted by it. And then I also want to expose them to syntax from the start, but not necessarily insist that they do everything through syntax but more just encouraging them to engage with it as a record of what they've done and try to get them to look a little bit at what it means and how it can make their life easier. But that said, I have to say personally, if I'm having a tired day and I just need some basic statistics, I'm probably gonna go for the graphics user interface as well instead of writing all of my code. Whereas if I'm doing something that's a deeper exploration, then I'm probably gonna go to the effort of writing code because it's going to be faster in the long run. Um, so then the software choices, I have not taught students in R and that is because I have generally been teaching standalone modules as well as the challenges of staff specialist training. So I actually could not do all of the techniques that I teach in R at this point because I've never had the time to dedicate to learning those techniques. Um, so I'm very much a product of the time when SPSS was the main mode of teaching introductory statistics. And then you might encounter a state, if I find my way around it. 
Um, and Excel is just because we use it a lot in office environments. So my first year module, I actually switched to using Excel. And that was solely for employability reasons, not because it's great fun to use for producing inferential statistics, because honestly, it's a real pain. Um, Stata has a graphics user interface, and I did actually use it to produce some of the data sets for my book because it has plugins that draw directly from the World Bank, for example. But it doesn't seem to be the primary choice for politics undergraduates in the UK. That might be partly due to legacy issues of SPSS having the market share, um, partly licensing and so on. And then there's SPSS, which has reasonable support for the statistical techniques commonly taught in an introductory modules and quite a well-developed um, graphics user interface. So then the, the plug for the book, so statistics for politics and international relations. Um, why did I bother to write a book? It was originally supposed to be three people contributing. So when I signed up as a postdoc, um, there were three of us and we were going to do four chapters each. And then one of them dropped out, so we're going to do six chapters each. And then it ended up being me. And I have to say, I had some days when I questioned the meaning of life. Um, but I got there in the end because I did thoroughly believe that this was the right way to teach statistics. It's not, there aren't other things out there. But um, it was applying my experience as a student and a teacher. And it's very much focused on that applied aspect of statistics. So it's thinking, what does this mean? How can I learn about the political world using data? And the two primary data sets are the UN's human development data with a few kind of World Bank indicators thrown in as well, and the European Social Survey. So one of my frustrations in working with textbooks up to this point had been the overwhelming focus on the American National Election Survey and very American-centric um, politics literature that didn't necessarily speak to what our students were interested in looking at. Um, or you would get the classic SPSS survival manual type of approaches, which were very much click here, click here, click here, but didn't necessarily help you understand that disciplinary hook of what does this mean for answering questions that I'm interested in. Um, so it's different, first of all, in its geographic emphasis, second, in trying to use readily available secondary data that covers a much wider range of countries and perspectives than other books, um, and also trying to constantly embed the scientific method in the approach. So at the University of Nottingham, we've now designed quite a scientific method route through our comparative politics teaching. And we start straight away in the first semester teaching them, you know, research question, theory, hypotheses, data, evaluation. So that's the approach that's taken in this book is just ask a question about the world and try to find an answer. Um, I do avoid extensive maths. I'm pretty sure the only equation that's in the book is for calculating percentages. So it is very much pitched at students who have that real statistic phobia that any numbers at all are scary things. And it's just trying to strip out that aspect of things so that they can concentrate on meaning. So it's not going to be pitched very much to the market of a student who's doing an advanced quantitative track. Um, I'm trying to teach both syntax and point and click because I think it's really important that they start with syntax from the start and that it's not a bolt on that we introduce later on. So even if it's just that you click paste and then run it after you produce something, but just introducing the idea that this is normal and this is a core part of it. But I think one of my favorite things about stats is actually the visualizations of it because even if you're not actually interrogating the data, you're not running anything inferential because let's be honest, a lot of the stuff that we look at is actually just the scripted statistics. Um, the data visualization is something that I found really lacking in a lot of the resources that I ran across and a lot of it I felt like I had to self-teach to figure out how to make a graph. But at the same point, a graph could help me get to know my data really, really quickly that I could produce 
huge tables or I could have a graph that I could see very rapidly whether there was anything that was worth interrogating in more detail. So what I encourage my students to do is you just look at the shape of the data, get to know it, ask questions about what the basic features of my variables are before I start trying to run any sort of inferential test about things, just get to know it. And often visualization is a shortcut to getting to know it. Um, but it's also about always thinking towards that endpoint of not just, I produce this thing, but what does it mean and how do we report it? So as teachers, when we're teaching statistics, we usually have an expectation that they're going to make everything look pretty before they submit it to us. Um, but we're just assuming that they know how to do that. And what I find is often they don't even have kind of the basic skills of how to copy and reformat a table and how to exclude all of the extra information that SPSS spits out. They didn't actually want and don't need, but how do we write up and report the key stuff? And then of course the standard guidance and activities to go with it. Um, so the kind of, questions that I looked at were things that were driven by the kind of curriculum questions that we address and each chapter explores one or two research questions and things like what are the characteristics of people who are hostile to immigration what's the relationship between gender inequality and development uh, why are conservatives happier than liberals what is the level of democracy or how does the level of democracy affect the level of gender equality and uh, because this was written a few years ago now who's likely to identify with UKIP and I think we're now at well since UKIP we've had Brexit party and now reform um, so that reference has become a little bit dated but it's this type of question where it's just showing first we ask a question about the world and then we make hypotheses about it after we figure out what people think they know about the world and then we go and test those hypotheses against data and then we make a conclusion whether that hypothesis was supported or not. I will say I'm a bit heretical in that I don't do null hypotheses um, partly because our students are usually under very constrained word counts and it feels like it's implied anyways but it's maybe a waste of space. Um, but also because I just want them to focus on applying the statistics. And if the application of that says there's no relationship, there's no relationship, but I don't tend to use the terminology of null hypothesis. And I know that some people would probably want to have a shakedown with me about that. Um, so as I said, like I'm generally pitching the way that I teach to an assumption that the student doesn't know very much about statistics and it's, kind of very introductory level, I've learned that I need to strip out quite a lot of content and focus on the core things that they probably need the most in order to read political literature and maybe might use after graduation. So this very much is not pitched at the key step end of the spectrum. Um, it's focused on descriptive statistics and it kind of ends with regression but the focus within that is much more on understanding what you've produced i don't focus as much on measures of statistical significance because particularly using the european social survey and the un data almost anything you run is going to get statistical significance but it's more focusing on understanding strength of relationship between variables so of course we should establish is is this likely to be a thing but the focus for making any conclusions about how the world works has to be on how much of a thing is it um so it's much more about that relationship um so just to kind of round things out with reflections on 15 years of stats teaching and lessons i've learned along the way i always put too much content in and then each year strip out a little bit more i find that students are capable of so much more than we often ask them to do so i teach only independent research projects from first year onwards and the expectation is that they can learn how to write a question about the world 
and enter it using data. But the quality of information that I get back from them, looking at a topic that they're interested in, is so much more interesting as a researcher. More recently, I've learned that the mode of assessment can be a driver of student success or failure. This was kind of an accidental learning. So I've always been against exams with stats because of the applied focus that unless I could have an exam in a computer lab in which they are actually doing things, um, I thought a data report was much more sensible because I want them to work through a question and look at data and have lots of messy stuff that comes up with no results and then present me with the final conclusion. But a couple of years ago, because of COVID, we cut our assessment tariff and it was getting to the point where it would actually be very hard to write a coherent data report hitting all of the elements I was asking them to hit. So I switched to a choose your own adventure that I called a portfolio, um, but strongly encouraged students to present their results as a poster if they didn't want to do a data report, provided them with examples, provided them with the same thing that was presented as a data report and a research poster and provided them with examples of some staff research posters that we have up around the department. And what I found is despite everything else that I had tried to make the content engaging and accessible to everybody and available whenever they wanted to do it, it was that that changed student success drastically. So allowing students to submit in a poster format suddenly closed the black white awarding gap on my module it made a difference for students who had all kinds of different disabilities that suddenly there was much less variation in module performance based on a student's personal characteristics and that made me realize that actually my students were understanding more than i thought but they weren't necessarily able to demonstrate it to me the way that i had been asking them to do it so that's been an interesting lesson to learn. Um, and the other thing is to freely proclaim that it certainly has not won me many commendations at the time from my students. So during COVID, I looked really good because of my ability to produce good digital materials. Um, but I've had plenty of disheartening bouts of module feedback. And then a couple of years later is when the commendations start trickling through of, yeah, I really hated it at the time, but now I'm so glad you made me do it. Or dissertation supervisors who recognize the improvement in their students' abilities to think through research question, evidence, etc. Um, but I would say as someone who's on the education-focused career track, um, that has been quite tricky at times for demonstration my excellence as a teacher. And so I've had to rely quite hard on some of those external validations um, and having very sympathetic and supportive line managers who were willing to take sometimes the student satisfaction hit in the short term because we were confident that this was the right thing to do in the long term. So I think it's a mixture of different reflections and things that I've learned about what I do in the classroom and the things that happen outside the classroom that are enablers of the success of that kind of approach. And I will stop my reflections there.